Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's Richard. Hey, uh, I'm here to talk to you today about what is best in life. I originally wrote this talk about a year ago for an audience of web developers, but it applies to anyone who works in tech or engineering disciplines or anyone who cares about ethics in tech. It's not particularly high level. Uh, there's no coding examples. There are some bad coding jokes. You've been warned. Anyway, I named this talk The Good Life, but actually it's about ethics in software engineering. Uh, a bit about my background, I started out at university studying engineering, uh, mechanical engineering, which I hated. And I switched to studying philosophy, which I loved. And now, 10 years later, my official job title is front-end engineer. Uh, go figure. But, so I'm a front-end engineer these days, but I usually refer to myself as a developer. I've always felt a bit uncomfortable with the title of engineer, though I couldn't really put my finger on why. Like, maybe it felt like I was claiming some sort of prestige I hadn't earned. I didn't complete my engineering degree or study computer science. I'm mostly self-taught. I like to think I'm all right at my job, but I still feel like I'm hacking things together most of the time. Now, back in the day, many of us who build websites used to call ourselves webmasters or webmistresses, which I still think is an amazing job title, by the way. I'm kind of sad that I didn't start my career early enough to have a webmaster role in the job history section of my CV. Uh, it's a bit like social justice warrior, like people use it as an insult, but frankly, I think it sounds badass. Anyway, so we were webmasters and webmistresses, and then that title fell out of fashion and we became web developers, and now many of us have the very professional sounding title of engineers. And I don't think that's a bad thing or that we should stop calling ourselves engineers. Call yourself whatever you want, like you can be a techno viking or an agile pirate ninja running a full stack glitter unicorn if that makes you feel better, there's one there. Uh, but we used to be working on dinky little websites that were kind of thrown together, and now we're working on massive professional operations that form the financial backbone of multi-billion dollar corporations. We've come a long, long way from being webmasters and webmistresses. But a lot of us are still self-taught and didn't go through any standardized training process. And don't get me wrong, like this is great. Uh, it helps uh, ease barriers to entry, which I think is a very good thing. But as the industry gets more professional, it might be worth thinking about other trappings of professionalism. If we're going to call ourselves engineers, then there are a lot of ethical duties and codes, um, ethical duties and codes of responsibility that go along with that title. A hundred years ago, civil engineering was in a similar situation to how the tech industry is now. As the industrial revolutions proceeded behind them, Engineers found new ways to use all the fancy new technologies uh, they had developed. They grew more sophisticated in their approach, and their projects ballooned in scale and complexity. But as these projects became more ambitious, there was an accompanying problem, a rise in major engineering disasters. The turn of the 20th century saw a wave of epic structural failures, including some massive bridge collapses. And also the great Boston molasses flood, which you can see here, uh, which if I had to name my favorite disaster of all time, this would have to be it, just for the mental image of a tsunami of liquid sugar, 50 feet high, traveling 35 miles an hour, consuming everything in its path. Like, it's terrifying. Also, kind of delicious. <laughs> anyway, these disasters had a profound effect on the way the public saw engineering, and they forced engineers to confront their shortcomings. So as a result, they began to regulate themselves more intensely and it established standardized industry codes of ethics. So what is ethics? Ethics is a branch of philosophy that is devoted to answering questions about what is best in life. So questions like these. And I know what you're all thinking. I can see the cogs in your software developer minds turning over. You're thinking, that's easy. What is best in life? Both spaces and tabs on alternating lines. <laughs> What is the good life? It's when the client is banned from feature requests. <laughs> we should live by outsourcing our job to China and spend all day on Reddit. You should behave towards other people by interrupting them when they have their headphones on. And the purpose of life is clearly replacing everything with JavaScript. You're all monsters. So philosophers like to do things called thought experiments, which are like real experiments, but even better, because you never have to get out of your armchair. One of the most famous of them is the trolley problem. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with it. It's a pretty common one these days, but for those who aren't, go through it quickly. There is a runaway trolley barreling down the railway tracks, 
and ahead on the tracks, there are five people tied up and unable to move. The trolley is heading straight for them. You're standing some distance off in the train yard next to a lever. If you pull this lever, the trolley will switch to a different set of tracks. However, you notice that there is one person on the side track. You have two options. One, do nothing, and the trolley kills the five people on the main track. Or two, pull the lever, diverting the trolley onto the side track where it will kill one person. So which is, the, which is the most ethical choice? So now, here's the audience interaction part of the talk. Quick show of hands, no wrong answers. Which of you would do nothing? Okay. And which of you would pull the lever? All right, okay, cool, so we got mostly pulling the lever. Now, imagine instead of a switch, you're standing on a bridge over the tracks next to an extremely large man. The trolley is coming, and the only way you can stop it is to push the large man onto the tracks. He's the only one big enough to slow down the trolley. Like, if you jump on, it's not going to do anything. Trains just go straight through you. So he's looking you right in the eyes. He can see what you're thinking. He's terrified. He's begging you not to do it. What do you do? So how many of you would push the large man onto the tracks? A bit fewer this time. Okay. And how many of you would do nothing? All right. A lot more. So... The trolley problem has been the subject of many surveys, which tend to find that approximately 9 out of 10 respondents would throw the switch to kill the one and save the five. However, in the large man situation, the situation reverses, and only 1 in 10 people would push him onto the tracks. So that mostly corresponds to what we got here. We're maybe slightly more bloodthirsty than that in this crowd, but mostly it's pretty similar. Incidentally, a 2009 survey of professional philosophers found that only 68% of them would throw the switch, 8% of not would not switch, the remaining 24% had another view or just could not answer. <laughs> so if you're ever tied to a train track by a cartoon villain, you'd better hope that the person by the switch isn't a moral philosopher. <laughs> so why the difference in the two outcomes? One theory is that it's because two different parts of your brain are fighting with each other. Some researchers looked at people's brains using fMRI machines and demonstrated that personal dilemmas, like pushing a man off a footbridge, engage brain regions associated with emotion, whereas impersonal dilemmas, like diverting the trolley by flipping a switch, engage regions associated with controlled reasoning. And these different brain processes essentially compete with each other whenever you have to make a tough, uh, a tough moral decision. Basically, inside your brain, you've got a monkey and a robot, literally a monkey and a robot, fighting over the controls. Every time you have to make a moral decision, they duke it out. The monkey understands something simple like pushing someone off a bridge, and it's horrified. But it doesn't understand something complex like a mechanical switch. So in that situation, the gut response is reduced, and we're able to throw the lever without feeling such a crushing sense of moral horror. Now, some people have a stronger monkey, and some people have a stronger robot, that we've seen today. And that's great, because they're both useful in different situations. But this is tricky for we programmers, because we work on usually fairly complex problems, which might make it trickier for our monkey brains to trigger some kinds of moral responses. By the way, if you think it's hard for programmers to experience the full range of ethical response, then spare a thought for autonomous vehicles. Self-driving cars don't have meat brains, and you can't make a perfectly ethical algorithm. You can only make it as good as the humans who programmed it, and we can't even agree on whether or not to use tabs or spaces. There are some really tricky problems here that self-driving cars will face, like we prefer a self-driving car to swerve into a pile of trash rather than hit someone, like, just like a person might. But computers can make these kinds of decisions quicker than we can. So if we decide in advance what we want them to do, they'll follow our instructions. So we'd probably want to program our car to hit a single adult rather than a busload of school children, right? But what if the adult is a Nobel Prize winning cancer researcher? What if the adult is driving the car? Would we want the car to sacrifice its driver? And would you choose to buy a self-driving car that's designed to sacrifice your life to save others? So some researchers at MIT came up with a nice solution for this. They built an app to mine data on people's answers to different trolley problems so they can use it to help them decide how autonomous cars should behave in different scenarios. The website's called Moral Machine, and you can go there right now and start judging scenarios. Like this one, we have to choose between a male athlete driving a car and a jaywalking baby. On the one hand, the baby doesn't know, or probably doesn't know, uh, not to cross on a rave signal. But on the other hand, 
it might grow up to hit, be Hitler, you know? So it's a tough call. Anyway, moral machine is cool, but it doesn't help us most of the time because we can't outsource all our ethical decision-making to the internet. We're just internet individuals working on our laptops, and we have these ridiculous meat brains, and we have to make our own decisions about whether to kill baby Hitler. So, of course, we sometimes make the wrong call. So let's shift gears for a little and consider the Volkswagen emissions scandal. You might recall that VW added special software to millions of diesel cars that would detect when their exhaust fumes were being checked by emissions regulators and change performance to pass these tests. As a result, they managed to completely uh, bypass emission standards in the US, EU, and elsewhere for a period of about five years. Their workaround allowed them to emit up to 40 times more nitrous, uh, nitrogen oxide than what US emission standards allow. By some estimates, air pollution causes around 40,000 early deaths per year in the UK alone. So it's, it's pretty safe to assume that Volkswagen's technical hack is likely to result in several thousand, or at least several hundred, premature deaths, plus thousands more case of as cases of asthma and other lung disease. And as someone who recently started experiencing asthma symptoms for the first time since, uh, since I was a child, probably because of London's air pollution, I take this a little bit personally. So when I heard last year that one of the engineers at VW was in prison for his role in the scandal, I thought, good. But on the other hand, I've kind of got to give credit where it's due. Like VW's defeat device is a pretty brilliant technical hack. It's ingenious. I can imagine that the engineers who created it must have felt pretty proud of themselves at the time. But at the same time, you also wonder why nobody spoke up at one of their internal meetings to say, hey pals, do you think maybe we're assholes? How do they get it so wrong? Are they just inherently bad people? So maybe it's because the monkey part of their brain was completely unable to deal with the complexity of the problem. You've got cars and software hacks and air pollution, and then decades later, some people you don't know might die. It's all a bit much for the poor monkey to handle. So we established earlier that ethical reasoning involves an internal struggle for control. And a weird thing about humans is that we can sometimes actually forget to act ethically when we're so focused on achieving a goal that we forget to think about the consequences of our actions. Or else we justify it to ourselves in ways that don't stand up to scrutiny, but we never stop to properly reflect. I'm sure we've all done this at some point. I definitely have. Um, and it's led to some of my biggest screw-ups. When you're looking at a wall of code, it's very easy to forget about the humans who will be affected by your decisions, IRL. And unlike civil engineering, it's usually easy to fix mistakes. Just roll out a patch or an upgrade. In tech, we like to move fast and break things, but we don't want to move fast into oncoming traffic and break people. I think the monkey brain is a factor in many, some of our, many of our biggest ethical lapses in tech today. Whether it's Facebook enabling fake news and Equifax with their criminally sloppy security, or just JavaScript developers being too lazy to bother making their websites accessible for disabled people and keyboard users. I'm looking at all of you, and, and me too. But I want to believe that the people making these decisions are doing so because they're not thinking hard enough about the consequences and the people affected by their actions. However, there's also those who say, hey, I don't know about all that ethics stuff. I'm just an engineer. It's not my responsibility. Like Mr. Von Braun here, who knew he couldn't be at the forefront of, Nazi, of rocket research in Nazi Germany if he didn't go along. And he didn't care what crimes he had to turn a blind eye to, blind eye to as long as he was allowed to play with his rockets. So to be clear, nobody is exempt from having to behave ethically. Scientists and engineers aren't a special group that get to be amoral and don't have to think about this stuff. Ethics contaminates everything, whether you're building rockets or designing algorithms to help police identify gang members, you have a duty to continue, consider how they might be used. With so many examples of ethically compromised decision-making in tech, it's easy to get pessimistic. There's some good news, though. If it's easy for people to act ethically when they don't think about it, then the flip side to this is that it follows that people tend to behave ethically when you remind them to. And it can, follow, it can happen even when you do it in subtle ways. For instance, some new researchers in Newcastle found that just hanging out posters of staring human eyes in a cafeteria was enough to significantly change people's behavior and made people twice as likely to clean up after themselves. 
If just a poster of eyes can achieve that much, then imagine what else we can do with an, we can accomplish with just a few well-placed reminders. We want to establish an organizational culture where people tend to act morally and where there are lots of positive examples for us to emulate. And I think that reminders are a powerful tool, tool to help us achieve this. I mentioned before that many engineering industry bodies introduced formal codes of ethics in the early 20th century. These came along with more le legal reg uh, regulations and barriers to entry, which I don't think is good for our industry, but ethical codes are a great idea. And that's already been touched on in one talk this, this, this week, this weekend. The, these are a great way to remind people to act ethically, because basically when you tell people, don't be a dick, they'll be less likely to be a dick. We already do this with codes of conduct at conferences and other events, including EMF camp and open source GitHub repositories. We can do this at our organizations too. They don't have to be complicated. In fact, the simpler the better. This one is from the American Society of Civil Engineers, but you can see it fits on one slide. Like it's pretty simple. Uh, the important thing is to set appropriate expectations for ethical behavior. There are loads of other codes of ethics around that you can use as inspiration. They are very hard to write, I hear. Uh, read over some of the different codes, discuss them with your colleagues, and think about what sort of ethical principles you choose for your own work, your team, and your company. You can use an existing co uh, code of ethics or borrow different aspects and make, or make your own. Once you've chosen an ethical code, communicate it within your team. How you communicate it is up to you. For example, you could include it in your onboarding for new starters or add ethical checks to checklists and documentation for new projects. Or you could run internal publicity campaigns, maybe like posts, posters on the wall, maybe with some eyes on top of them. <laughs> the important thing is that it becomes part of your team and your company culture. This act of communicating expectations is important for empowering team members to speak up if they're uncomfortable before it's too late. A few years ago, I was working for a consultancy who assigned me to a website project for a client that I didn't really improve of. But I got so invested in solving the technical aspects of the problem, of the project, that I didn't stop to think about whether I was morally okay with working for this client until I was already deeply invested. I moaned about the client a little bit to some colleagues, and they told me, hey, like, if you wanted, didn't want to work for this client, that's fine, but you should have said something at the start of this project. It made me realize that it was okay to say no to client projects at this employer but also that the appropriate time to do that is before you start work. The later you leave it, the harder it is to do. So the next time a dodgy client came along, I felt more comfortable expressing my concerns up front rather than just procrastinating it for later, and we ended up turning down the client. If we establish policies ahead of time that say that it's okay to speak up if you're uncomfortable, we can avoid these kinds of situations. I tend to think of it as being a little like encouraging developers to submit bug reports and point out problems in your applications or your processes. If everyone feels empowered to speak up, then you're all better off. On a related side, side note, if you speak up about ethically dubious practices at your place and your employer doesn't listen, you may have a duty to report it to the authorities or otherwise make it public. A basic dilemma in engineering ethics is that an engineer has a duty to their client or employer but an even gr greater duty to report a possible risk to others from a client or an employer failing to follow the in engineer's instructions. A classic example of this is the Challenger shuttle, space shuttle disaster. NASA engineers raised warnings about the faulty O-rings and the boosters and the dangers posed by the low temperatures on the morning of the launch, but managers disregarded these warnings and failed to adequately report these technical concerns to their supervisors. It was later argued that, in these circumstances, the engineers had a duty to circumvent their managers and shout about the dangers until they were heard. I mentioned building ethics checks into processes as a regular reminder to encourage ethical thinking as early as possible. A friend of mine who works as a psychotherapist tells me that their training includes ethics checks as a core part of the processes. So whenever they're trying to make a tough decision, they have these questions they can use, which are designed to trigger different types of emotional responses. So here's a few examples here. You got the, the first one here, which I think is kind of quite a monkey brain question. It's a good one for triggering emotional reactions like shame. Would you be happy for everyone to know the decision you may, you've made? 
So for example, if you're considering being lazy about making your site accessible, imagine there's a disabled person sitting next to you and think about whether you'd be comfortable explaining your code choices to them. The second one seems designed to trigger more of a consequentialist response. It's maybe a bit of a, more of a, a rationalist, robot brain approach. Like, do you think the coach, consequences are acceptable? The last one reminds me of Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative, that you should only do something if you're okay with it being a universal law. If there's any professional philosophy here, please don't judge me, I've got this wrong, but that's my take. But, um, yeah, you should only do something if you're okay with it being a universal law. So that's two, if Kant's your thing. I think these are a great start, but feel free to build off them or tailor them to your own work. Finally, we can encourage developers to develop, um, to de developers to develop more empathy for their users by encouraging them to meet them in person. A great way to do this is to get developers to sit in on user testing sessions. A nice additional benefit of this is that empathy for your users helps you design better user-centered solutions. So, win-win. So these ideas are just a start. They won't fix anything. Like, they won't put a stop to the fact that a small handful of mega corporations own our digital lives and strip mine them for profit. But you know, like one step at a time. By the way, if you have any questions or suggestions, please come chat to me afterwards or get in touch with me with using any of my imaginative online handles. Thank you.